So if I can maybe begin by asking if you could tell us uh, about yourself and your practice as well. Well, uh, firstly, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much to uh, you all for having me to speak at this continuing professional development webinar series. Uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be able to speak to you all in particular about a subject which is very close to my heart, which is advocacy. Now, uh, I think as many of you may know, I was born in Malaysia and I grew up in Malaysia. Uh, and I then went to the United Kingdom to do my A-levels at which I have since remained to practice at the English bar. I specialize primarily in commercial disputes, both in the field of litigation as well as arbitration. A lot of the work which I do tends to be derived from or otherwise has connections with Asia, in particular, Singapore, Malaysia, China, and also other jurisdictions in the region. I was called to the bar in 2002, although I formally commenced practice only in 2004, and I was appointed Queen's Counsel, or I took silk, as it's sometimes colloquially known, in 2018. So my practice takes me, COVID notwithstanding, uh, across the world to different jurisdictions in circumstances where a lot of my uh, arbitrations or litigation is seated in jurisdictions outside of England and Wales, and in addition to the Asian jurisdictions, which I just mentioned, I, I'm also admitted to the uh, British Virgin Islands Bar and have in the past been admitted on an ad hoc basis to the Cayman Islands Bar as well. So I think that's in a nutshell is uh, my practice as well as my background, Greg. Thanks. So much. Uh, did you have a in your formative years at the Bar? Uh, I, I, I would say yes. I think there were many people who influenced the development of my practice as a lawyer and in particular as an advocate. But if I had to name uh, an individual who perhaps had a greater impact than most in terms of my development as a barrister, it would be my former pupil master, Vernon Flynn QC, who had taken the time and effort to train me and obviously provide me with a solid foundation as an advocate, both in terms of my oral advocacy, and just as important as a written advocate, honing my written advocacy skills. Um, he was an excellent teacher, he led by example, and uh, such is the nature of our relationship that we continue working together even until now, albeit in a very different capacity. Uh, as opposed to that in which we first started, which was as a pupil and a pupil supervisor. Great. Um, would you be able to identify um, one particular uh, skill uh, he taught you that uh, you find yourself continuing to apply in your practice today? Yes. I, I think, in fact, it's not just a skill which he taught me, but it's a skill which I, uh, in my opinion, is a most invaluable skill for anyone who wants to hone a practice as an advocate and its ability to listen. Now, you might think it's strange that I picked that uh, over and above other skills because it might be said that advocacy is uh, premised principally on the ability to deliver submissions, cross-examine a witness, um, to try and persuade your audience, whether it's a judge or a bench of judges, or an arbitration tribunal of the merits of your client's case. And so that involves advocacy in the sense of delivering, whether orally and or in written form, submissions and or questions designed to assist your client's case. However, uh, to my mind, the most important and oft underrated skill of an advocate is the ability to listen. To listen to the judge and the tribunal's questions, to listen to the answers which are given by a witness, whether it's a factual or expert witness in the course of cross-examination, and to be able to react to uh, the questions from the court or the answers which are given from the witness, because any good advocate is able to deliver a good speech or perhaps to deliver a scripted cross-examination. But what I think really distinguishes a good advocate from a great advocate is that a great advocate is not just able to deliver pre-prepared remarks or to follow a script which has been set out for the course of the hearing, but one who can, in fact, listen, react, and most importantly, adjust, and maybe even sometimes change fundamentally 
the path that they had set out in the course of preparing for their hearing. So the most important tool uh, or most important characteristic of an advocate, which Vernon taught me and which I think is uh, perhaps the oft underrated but an invaluable tool of advocacy is the ability to listen and you know, subsequent to that, the ability to react to what you have observed or listened in the course of a hearing. Sure. No, that, that's, yeah, it does sound to be very invaluable advice. Um, Jyoti, if I can maybe move to the, uh, the specific topic for our discussion today, which is um, oral submissions. Um, would you say that oral arguments uh, is an important form of advocacy in today's practice? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the slightly elongated answer is absolutely for the simple reason that uh, I am afraid in this day and age, whether you are talking about court-based litigation or you are talking about arbitration and irrespective of the jurisdiction in which the dispute is being fought out, more often than not, I have seen written submissions assume uh, complex, uh, sorry, assume the form of complex and occasionally prolix documents. And the problem with written submissions, and by that I extend the definition of written submissions to witness statements, occasionally expert reports, because um, again, very unfortunately, in this day and age, witness statements and expert reports are not what they should be, which is a vehicle through which the factual witness and or the expert can deploy their uh, evidence, whether it's factual evidence or expert evidence. And sometimes, or more often than not actually, it resembles written submissions themselves. Mm -hmm. And the problem therefore with written submissions is that they tend to be overly long, don't really focus on the things that really matter. And therefore this heightens the importance of oral advocacy because when you are placed before the court or the tribunal, and you've only got a fixed period of time within which to make out your case and to engage with the court or the tribunal's questions, it rather forces the advocates, uh, certainly the, the best advocates, to clarify their thoughts, to distill their case into the essence of what really matters, and therefore to pick out the important points from the less important ones. Uh, and in my experience, a lot of cases, in fact, most, if not all cases, typically turn on very few points of contention. There may be a lot of issues and disputes, but more often than not, uh, you know, cases will turn will tend to turn on the fulcrum of one, two, maybe three important points in the course of a case. So the trick really is to be able to work out which of those uh, points which are in contention are what I call the fulcrum points on which uh, the outcome of a case will turn, and to home in on those points in the course of your oral advocacy. And that's why I think oral advocacy is important. And that's why when I sit as an arbitrator, I always look forward to receiving oral submissions from counsel because that is my opportunity to listen to what the counsel in on both sides think are, is truly important and also to give me an opportunity to tease out from them what the case is really about and what are the fulcrum points on which the case will ultimately turn. Would you say that uh, submissions and um, um, arguments has become more important today uh, as compared to when you first started out in practice in 2002, I think you mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the, the short answer is yes, because uh, again, um, the uh, as time has progressed from the time I started out in 2002, when I was called to the bar in 2002 now, the prolixity of written submissions, I'm afraid, has been compounded. Um, the problem has become so acute that uh, in England, the English Commercial Court recently issued a practice direction, setting out what it expects of witness statements. In other words, no submissions of any kind, no uh, regurgitation or narratives or commentary on documentation, which is not really the function of witness statements, but it should be really a receptacle through which a witness can deploy his or her factual evidence that's not otherwise to be found in the documentation and certainly not supposed to assume the form of argumentation. Uh, unfortunately, this is perhaps a feature of practice that has uh, not yet been rolled out or certainly not extensively adopted in many other fora, including arbitration. And therefore, what this means is that this heightens the need for a clear, crisp and succinct oral advocacy. Sure. 
Jennifer, yeah. what, what would you say um, are the qualities um, of a good public speaker in general that uh, an advocate should seek to emulate when delivering an oral uh, submission in court? Yes. Uh, I would say that there are three things in particular, in addition to everything that we have just discussed. If you ask me to uh, distill them into sort of three things, the first thing I would say is structure. And there is nothing that's more frustrating than a speech that is brimming with good points, but is not structured and therefore very difficult to follow, such that it makes it hard for the decision maker, whether it's a court or a tribunal, to work out where a particular argument belongs in the rubric of their decision-making process. So structure is very important. And in circumstances where a case has, and I, I personally think every case should have, a list of issues, uh, preferably one that has been settled by the court or the tribunal, uh, the best way of trying to persuade the decision-maker is by organizing or compartmentalizing your oral submissions or indeed your cross-examination by reference to the list of issues and giving it the sort of structure which the court or tribunal can follow with ease. Better yet, if the court or the tribunal will be writing their judgment or award by reference to the list of issues, not only can you go, you, you can do no wrong, but in fact, you can help your cause by ensuring that the points you make are structured by reference to the very framework by reference to which they will be making their decision. The second thing I would say is, uh, it's a real bugbear of mine, but the point of oral advocacy is to persuade, and there is no better way of persuading than to get straight to the point at the very outset, from the very get-go. So, in other words, when you are seeking out to persuade, uh, again, the judge or the arbitrator of a particular point, the important thing to do is to say from the outset succinctly what the short answer to the overarching question is that is being asked at any given point in time. So, for example, if the issue that you're grappling with is, was there a breach of contract? Um, always tell the judge or the arbitrator from the very get-go what the answer is, yes or no, and succinctly why, and then you can elaborate. The reason for that is because it allows the decision maker, the court or the tribunal, a navigational pathway by reference to which they can anchor your submissions or perhaps the questions that you ask in cross-examination. Uh, otherwise, they will be at sea and they won't be able to, again, relate the submissions you are making to the conclusion you're asking them to draw. By co in contrast, if you tell them what the conclusion is from the very outset, they will know, right, you know, that's the conclusion he or she wants me to draw and succinctly what it is. And everything then falls into place because when you then develop it, they are reminded, obviously, of what the conclusion is you want them to draw and very succinctly what that reason is, it again provides them with a very useful framework by reference to which they can easily follow and hopefully accept the submissions that you are making. Uh, because there's nothing more frustrating than uh, either to read a skeleton argument or a written submission or to hear a speech where the, the advocate goes on and on, you know, explaining things, you know, tells a story, um, provides a narrative, but never really says in, in a clear, crisp, and succinct fashion. What is the short answer? What is the point of that uh, overarching submission? Don't bury your conclusion at the end because you will have lost your audience by the time you get to the end. Start with it at the beginning and then develop and flesh it out. Uh, not least because if you've got a tired, grumpy, uh, perhaps disinterested judge or arbitrator, chances are you will catch him or her's, her attention right at the very outset. Uh, you're more likely to do so uh, than at the very end. And if so, then what you want to do is you want to deploy your punchline from the very get-go so that if there is nothing else that they take away from your speech, at least they take away what the conclusion is and in succinct terms what the reasons for that conclusion are. The third point I would like to highlight is in terms of citation of authority, and this is, I'm afraid, another bugbear of mine, that there is nothing that I find uh, more annoying when I'm sitting uh, to have counsel tell me what authorities that they are citing, then proceed to describe the authority, the factual background and the decision, um, or rather the, the ratio of the decision, but not tell me what is the principle for which that authority is cited. That is the wrong way around to my mind. What you should do when you're citing authority is say, what is the principle that you are inviting the court or the tribunal to find? And then say, what is the authority? 
that is being cited in support of that principle itself. So, you know, this is the right way around things because, again, the, the principle that you want the court or the tribunal to find is, in a sense, the conclusion you want them to draw, the legal conclusion you want them to draw in the context of the case. Then go on to cite that authority uh, and obviously advert to whatever passage it is in that authority which supports the principle slash conclusion that you want the court or the tribunal to draw. Thanks, Jay. Um, would you share with us um, the, the, the steps you ordinarily take when preparing for a uh, oral submission? Uh, the steps are ordinary. Well, the first thing that I do is I actually am harking back to the point I made about a list of issues is I would usually set out at the very top of my, my notes, which I'm working on when I'm preparing my oral submissions. And it's in fact the same when I'm preparing for my cross-examination is by reference to each of the list of issues. What is the punchline conclusion I want the tribunal or the court to draw in respect of each of those issues? Um, and then under the, each of those headings, then set out what uh, are the, in bullet point form, what are the submissions I would make, whether it's legal submissions or submissions by reference to the factual or expert evidence or otherwise, um, in support of the conclusion that I want the tribunal or the court to draw. It focuses the mind because then you know where you are and certainly it keeps you focused on what submissions you need to make in order to get to your end destination. Particularly useful, I think, in the context of cross-examination. Sure. Now, uh, Jennifer, do you, do you write down um, in full uh, your written submissions uh, prior to actually delivering it? Or are you more of an advocate who takes very short notes and uses that when delivering the, the uh, oral arguments? Um, I think that there is um, a, it's a sort of elastic concept because I am I'm certainly not one who sort of writes down word for word everything which I say, such that it becomes um, scripted to the ex to the extreme. But I certainly have sort of very full bullet points when I am preparing my oral submissions. Not because I want to use it as a crutch for the purposes of delivering my speech, but rather it helps me focus my mind as to what are the points I wish to make, and more importantly, helps me foreshadow or anticipate the questions from the bench and or the counter arguments that would come from the other side. So I really use it as a means of kicking the tires around, stress testing the arguments in the course of preparation. More often than not, when I actually get on my feet, I, I don't actually read from the uh, scripts or from the notes themselves because they are really a means to an end. Uh, it's of course very useful to have the notes there in the event that I need to remind myself of what's the next point on the agenda, et cetera. But um, truth be told, the notes are very rarely referred to in the course of my oral presentation when I really get to the hearing itself. So they are really an aid memoir to help me navigate my way through the speech uh, in the event that I have finished a point and I want to work out what's the next one on the agenda. And also a lot of the hearings which I do uh, don't really afford me an opportunity to deliver my speech as scripted or as written in it at any rate. It usually involves intervention from the bench and therefore it sort of takes you down you know, the path, the byways and the alleyways, um, which you might have uh, perhaps foreshadowed, but not necessarily have you know kitted out what the specific response should be in the course of preparing for those oral submissions. And, and usually um, an advocate would have filed their written arguments uh, beforehand prior to the hearing. Um, is there a way to effectively use uh, those written arguments, the, the written submission that you would have, you would have filed um, during the course of your oral submissions? Uh, in fact, I, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to use, and certainly not verbatim, the written submissions that you have filed for the purposes of your oral submissions. The, the reason I say that is uh, more often than not, the oral submissions the primary objective of oral submissions is to allow you to respond to the written argument or the written submissions that have been filed by the other side and or to clarify, expand or emphasize the points of importance from your written argument, particularly in the context of the points that have been taken by the other side. 
there is nothing more stilted, artificial, and unpersuasive than a set of oral submissions that simply regurgitates what has been produced in writing beforehand, particularly one that does not engage with the written document that has been filed by the other side. So I, so the short answer, Greg, to your question is, is in my view, the um, written argument should have very little relevance in the course of preparing for your oral submissions, save that it uh, provides obviously a navigational tool to allow you to work out what the response should be to the points that have been made by the other side in their written document and to remind obviously the tribunal or the court as to what you had said in writing um, the first time round. The joint thing you touched on this um, a moment ago um, about uh, questions or, or, or statements from the bench. Um, how would you deal with an unexpected or an unanticipated um, a question or a statement from, from the judge? Well, um, there are two ways of dealing with it. There is um, what I call the sort of the, the pre-hearing phase and what I call the uh, in-hearing phase. As far as the pre-hearing phase is concerned, this is really part and parcel of prep. And this is really part and parcel to be precise of prep in the course of writing out your oral submissions. What I try to do is I try to anticipate what the bench will ask me in terms of my case or try to anticipate what the other side will say by way of counter argument. And this is where I have drawn from, and I'm very fortunate that I've had an opportunity to do so, draw from the reservoir of my experience as an arbitrator, which because of the number of cases in which I've sat as arbitrator, it sort of gives me a useful means of putting myself in the shoes of the tribunal and therefore trying to work out what questions as an arbitrator, I would ordinarily ask of counsel such that when the tables are turned and the boot is on the other foot and I'm counsel, the training I had received when I am sitting as arbitrator then helps me when I'm preparing for my case to work out what I think would be the questions from the tribunal and or from the other side. And so the, the, the question is premised, the question you asked me is premised on unanticipated or not foreshadowed question. And my answer, insofar as the pre-hearing phase is concerned, is to try and eliminate the unanticipated bits of the question, such that it might have been unanticipated when you prepare your written argument, but you try and anticipate the unanticipated when you're preparing, say, for your oral submissions, such that when the time comes, and I'm going to segue now to what I call the in-hearing phase, is when you are confronted with a, a question, whether or not it was unanticipated or unforeshadowed or, or whatever. Um, again, there are there's a part A and a part B answer. The part A answer is answer it straight up. Uh, I did a hearing earlier this week whereby I had a, a, an opponent, a fairly experienced opponent, who every time he was asked a question by the presiding arbitrator simply failed to provide a straight answer. He would wax lyrical um, and he would beat around the mulberry bush. And there was nothing more amusing than sort of seeing the frustrated look on the presiding arbitrator by dint of the fact that he simply hadn't answered the arbitrator's question. Answer it upfront, yes, no, and why? So a bit like my the style which I had uh, proposed or propounded um, is the style that one should adopt when you are writing your written submissions. Uh, and that's a part A answer. The part B answer is what if you don't know what the answer is? Perhaps it's an answer that is to do with the factual detail of the case, which you don't have at your fingertips necessarily. Or perhaps it is a question which you uh, don't know what the answer is as a matter of law. Uh, in those circumstances, what I would say is don't be too quick uh, off the mark to provide an answer. Instead, say to the tribunal or to the court that thank them for the question, say that you'd like some time to think about it and that you will revert to them in due course. There is no shame in saying to a tribunal or a court, in fact, they quite like it, that they've asked a really difficult question, a good question, and what you'd like to do is to give is to do that question justice by giving it the proper and careful consideration which it deserves before responding. But of course, if you were to, to sort of deploy that mechanism uh, in order to defer answering the question, make sure you answer it at some stage before the hearing ends. And, and is that uh, well received in your experience? Yes, it, it is. Uh, it, well, it's, it is, but obviously it's, um, you know, the devil is in the detail. 
uh, if, as I often do, you sort of see, you thank the tribunal and say, it's a, you know, it's a really good question. You didn't think about it, you know, but it obviously merits proper and careful consideration, you know, sort of flatter your tribunal slightly. They'll think, wonderful, I've asked a question that, you know, Learned Council hasn't even thought of, um, and they feel very chuffed with themselves, and they will obviously cut you some slack uh, and give you perhaps a little bit of leeway before you are uh, eventually asked to respond. But, you know, if you um and you are and you sort of provide a perhaps a slightly half-baked answer, a tentative answer, not very persuasive, uh, and then you ask for liberty to return to the question at the end, they might begrudgingly give it to you, but um, the damage has already been done by then. So if you don't know what the answer is, instead of volunteering a half-baked answer, you know, ask for obviously leave to consider and to think about it carefully before ultimately responding. Have you ever for a judge who uh, constantly interrupted your oral submissions? Uh, and if yes, how did you uh, deal with that situation? Uh, in fact, I, I, I would turn your question on its head, Greg. Have I ever encountered a judge or a tribunal that has not constantly interrupted my submissions? And the reality is, uh, particularly with my practice in the English commercial court, more often than not, my submissions are constantly punctuated by interruptions by the judge because that is simply their modus operandi. Uh, we get a lot of arbitrators these days who also do that, although, of course, there are uh, other arbitrators who politely listen to what you have to say and maybe reserve their questions, if any, to the very end. And um, you remember what I said to you previously about writing out the written submissions effectively not as a script from which one reads out, but effectively as a way of sort of kicking the tires around and stress testing your theories. The reason why I say that is because I'm so used to the idea, and perhaps I'm like this when I sit as arbitrator, to the bench actually asking me questions from the get-go, such that um, it trains me to be able to be sufficiently nimble and flexible, such that when I'm on my feet, um, not to be hide-bound by the idea that I've got a script which I've got to read out word for word, but rather be comfortable with the notion that I would have as a result of my preparation, understood and I'm completely on top of my case, such that I know what are the points I need to deploy in the course of my answers to the tribunal's questions, uh, and also to get comfortable with the process of interacting with, having a dialogue with the tribunal. And truth be told, I actually welcome questions from the tribunal because it gives me a steer as to what it is that's on their minds. Um, more often than not, the questions which a tribunal or a judge asks are in relation to things which perhaps they're not quite as persuaded by you, having read your skeleton argument, that might otherwise be the case. And it gives you a perfect opportunity to get to grips with the things which truly matter to them and on which the outcome of the case will turn. And so it's not a question of coping with the, interrupt, with the interventionist judge. Rather, it is um, ensuring that you are trained and embrace the prospect of an advocate as an advocate of the interventionist judge as an effective means of getting to grips with the things that are bugging the bench and on which you need to persuade in order to win the case. After all, there's no point in deploying submissions um, for which uh, you are pushing at an open door and the tribunal are with you, but rather what you really want to do is engage them on the things where they are perhaps sitting on the fence or they are tentatively against you uh, in the hope that you can get them off the fence or get them to change their minds in your favor. Jadpeep, um, uh, again, uh, we were speaking about um, virtual hearings and, and I understand that you're in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, you're either about to conduct a virtual hearing or, or have already conducted one. Uh, do, do you think that there are any advantages um, uh, to the conduct of a hearing done virtually? I, I do. Uh, in fact, I've, I've done two virtual hearings. And you know, for the audience out there, if you're wondering why I've traveled to Hong Kong to do a virtual hearing, uh, it's because uh, the bulk of my team are here in Hong Kong. So it facilitates communications during the course of the hearing that I am, in fact, physically in the same space as they are when the virtual hearing is being conducted. I have also done virtual hearings completely remotely from the rest of my team as well. So I've, I've done it both ways. And I think that virtual hearings has its advantages, particularly, and this is my first point, with regards to hearings which are short in duration and or interlocutory hearings. They're quite an efficient means of the disposing of a hearing without 
necessarily involving long distance travel with you know all the sort of carbon footprint that that entails and also is, is a very efficient means of uh, from a cost perspective of resolving a what would otherwise be a short hearing uh, secondly i think virtual hearings do have their advantages even for the longer hearings uh, in this sense there are functionalities that are can be employed or deployed rather with certain software that is typically used in the course of virtual hearings. So, for example, um, one of the software that I typically use in the context of my virtual hearings when I can help it is an electronic production of evidence or EPE function, which is typically offered by some of the leading uh, remote hearing service providers such as EPIC, EPIQ, or OPUS, OPUS. Uh, what they do is they are able to provide a platform by which a, a document is shared on the screen and you can use that obviously to blow a document up, highlight it, splice a document into two screens or perhaps put two or more documents on the same screen for comparison purposes to make a particular point, whether it's a course of oral submissions and or in the course of cross-examination, functionalities which are perhaps not necessarily deployed as often, if at all, in the context of an in-person hearing. So uh, I think there are advantages to virtual hearing. Of course, there are also uh, concomitantly disadvantages with virtual hearings. Uh, for instance, you don't necessarily get this, this sort of interaction, uh, particularly the nonverbal interaction that you would otherwise get, which forms part and parcel of the tapestry of uh, evidence by reference to which or, or material by reference to which a tribunal assesses the credibility of a witness or even perhaps sometimes the advocate that you get in the context of an in-person hearing. And, and I remember reading um, an article that, that, that you wrote, and I think it was on your LinkedIn, um, sometime last year, uh, where you mentioned that one particular advantage you, you, you uh, um, spotted in the conduct of a virtual cross-examination was the fact that the witness was, um, his appearance was blown up. And, mm, yes. You know, enlarged on the screen, so to speak, and you could see each particular, you know, reaction that he would uh, make with a particular question or anything of that sort. That's so, right. Yeah. And, and uh, have you found that there are any um, uh, techniques um, that are unique um, uh, insofar as advocacy is concerned uh, when conducting a hearing virtually as compared to uh, doing it uh, physically? Well, the, I, I think that one of the biggest features is the EPE feature, which I was just talking about. So that is certainly one feature. And um, the other one is, as you say, in the course of cross-examination, you have an ability to blow up the imagery of a witness's um, face and therefore able to observe, you know, every, sing, every little twitch, um, you know, when the question is being asked or more importantly, when the answer is being given. It also draws into sharper focus certainly as far as the upper half of a witness's body is concerned, they are nonverbal reactions, which of course you can observe in the course of an in-person hearing, but um, you observe it, or at least you should be able to observe it more diligently, you know, to a more meticulous level of detail when you are seeing on the screen, perhaps um, especially when the speaker view is engaged as opposed to the gallery view, um, the imagery of the witness and therefore their reaction to the question and their reaction to the answer mm -hmm. with greater clarity and to a higher specificity than might otherwise be the case if you were there at an in-person hearing. Do you think I could um, um, tell us what you think are the three most important uh, tips uh, to effectively prepare for an oral submission? Three most important tips. Well, um, the first most important tip, I'm afraid, is slightly old fashioned, which is that you need to read your materials. There are no shortcuts to this, um, particularly for those of you who act as lead counsel. The temptation is too great to rely on notes, uh, memos or perhaps drafts which your juniors have prepared. But there is no better substitute than to read the documents for yourself. And um, let me tell you what I do when I'm preparing for a hearing. And more often than not, I've, I've got um, a or more than one junior, which assists me in the context of my cases. But I always write my own speeches from scratch. And I always write all my cross-examination notes from scratch. And the reason why is because it helps you focus your mind. And um, it helps you find 
the, you know, get into the weeds of the documents themselves, because when you are writing your speech or writing your cross-examination, you actually have to turn the pages of the bundles and try and work out down to the very last footnote or, you know, the last level of detail, things which might perhaps escape uh, some juniors um, as a matter of experience. And, you know, these are the sort of things which are important in the context of an effective cross-examination. So preparation is key. That's the sort of first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is time management is critical. So when you have been pre-allotted a fixed period of time within which to deliver your oral submissions or to conduct a cross-examination, stick to it. Um, because what it does is it, uh, it keeps you on the good side of the bench. Um, you might think that you've got 101 points to deploy, all of which are important, and you could sort of detain them for, for days and days on end. I'm afraid uh, you will be sorely disappointed because a lot of uh, tribunal members and judges don't necessarily share your worldview of the importance of the points you want to deploy in a case. So stick to time. Time management is critical. And it also forces you as an advocate to, again, work out what are the important points and to deploy those rather than to provide a free range of points, some of which are more important than others. The, the third thing I would say, which is important in terms of preparation for an advocate is with reference to authorities, choose your best authority. Uh, there is nothing that is less persuasive to me when it comes to citation of authorities than to see a citation of a smorgasbord of authorities. Uh, you know, for every single point, sometimes you see, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, excessive citation of authorities that is unnecessary. Usually there's just one authority for, for the proposition you're making, maybe two, perhaps to show how it's been applied in subsequent years if the first authority is of some vintage. And the, the trick therefore is to ensure that you choose your best authority or at most your best two authorities for the single proposition you're making rather than to cite obviously a complete phalanx of authorities, most of which will probably go unread and ignored by the court or the tribunal at any rate. And Jeffrey, I hope you don't mind uh, a general question to do with uh, just the general skills of uh, an effective um, oral submission. Um, how important uh, do you think uh, PACE is when um, delivering an oral submission to the bench? Very important. When you go at speed, like a bullet train, no matter how persuasive your points are, they will not land with the tribunal or the court. You've got to be able to pace yourself, not just with reference to oral submissions, but also with reference to cross-examination. Because if the tribunal does not follow the point that you are making or the importance of the question you are asking the witness, then uh, it is perhaps an effort that is, I won't say wasted, but whose effectiveness is impeded by the fact that you haven't paced yourself. It's far better to have 10 pages worth of cross-examination delivered at the right pace than to have 15 delivered at the speed of light. And the reason I say that is there are times when I'm sitting and the um, advocate who is appearing before me goes like a freight train. And I can't follow what you know, that advocate is saying you know, every other minute. And the problem is that if I can't follow it, then you know, the point is lost on me. Yes, there might be a transcript, but the uh, impact of the advocacy is lost if the only way I'm able to appreciate what point that is being made is by rereading the transcripts. And do you think um, that pausing at the appropriate stage in your oral arguments is important and whether, and, and whether that uh, has an effect? The short answer is yes. Um, do you think uh, that uh, there is an importance placed on the tone of one's voice uh, when delivering an oral uh, submission? Uh, the short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is, uh, is as follows. Tone is important. Um, so is pitch and projection. Um, you don't want to be speaking softly because if people can't really hear you and they're straining to listen to what you have to say, then um, it again impacts obviously the effectiveness of your advocacy. But the reason why tone is also important, so that is really, I suppose, more about audibility rather than, than um, variation of tone. Variation of tone is important because accentuation emphasis, in other words, verbal emphasis uh, of a particular important point 
serves to highlight important points, critical points to the arbitrator or to the judge in contrast to other points which may be important but not so important. It's the equivalent of highlighting bold, underlining a point that you make in the course of written submissions, things which are particularly important. Also, it ensures that the bench is kept interested in your speech, in your presentation, in your cross-examination, otherwise you know, delivered in a monotonous form. They're human after all. It's, if it's hard to follow, then they don't buy it. If they don't buy it, then you know, it doesn't really sink in the same way. So yes, tone in terms of audibility is important. So is variation of tone as a means of emphasizing points which are important. I know if I could just maybe ask a question before I open up the discussion to the other lawyers. Um, what steps do you think I and um, the other junior members of the bar in, in attendance uh, could take to improve our skills uh, in delivering an effective oral submission? Well, what you can do to deliver a more effective oral submission is, is I'm afraid to do more of it. And you might think that's a little bit circular, isn't it? Uh, well, it's not actually, because whilst there is much to be said about observing good or even great advocates in action, and of course, there's a lot to be learned from observing how um, terrific people do it, but there is no better substitute than to do it yourself. To make the mistakes that you will almost certainly make along the way, to learn from your mistakes, to try and work out what is the best form of advocacy for you, what is your style, to discover obviously what is the most effective way for you to be an advocate, because no two advocates are alike. Uh, some advocates will do certain things better than others, uh, because they, everyone has got their own distinct style. You've got your own sort of distinct advocate's DNA. And therefore, in the circumstances, the best way of improving your skills as an advocate is to do more of it. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to now open the discussion up to uh, the floor, as it were, the other lawyers in attendance, um, and ask if they had any questions to ask uh, Jernfei, our speaker. Go ahead, Jace. You can please do pose your question to Jen Fei. Hi, Jen Fei. Hi, Jace. Hi, I just have a, a, a thanks for the session earlier. It's been really helpful. Uh, so my question is just how do you uh, well, how do you practice to speak without billers when um when you're when you're submitting? Because sometimes we tend to say a lot of ahs and ums when we're speaking. So how do you train yourself to basically speak eloquently without using those filler words? The answer to that, Jace, is um, rather uh, to do with pacing. So coming back to the question that Greg asks, uh, where you have a point that you want to make, but you are able to pace yourself, it gives you an opportunity to A, catch your breath, B, collect your thoughts before you move on to your next point. And naturally, all the fillers, the ums and the ahs will eliminate themselves uh, naturally in the course of your presentation. If you also, and this harks back to another point that Greg uh, asked me about, is if you pause in between points, whether for effects or otherwise, or just to collect your thoughts, again, that very naturally will eliminate all the fillers, the ums and the ahs. Therefore, the long and short of it is don't be in a hurry to get to your ultimate destination. Enjoy the process of advocacy. Enjoy the process of trying to persuade the tribunal of the points that you make. Pace yourself, pause at suitable intervals, and you will be surprised to discover how naturally all the fillers can be eliminated if you do just that. Thanks, Jenfi. That's very helpful. You're most welcome. Actually, Jenfi, I had a question. Um, uh, I think it may be a follow up to something you mentioned earlier. Um, on, on how um, one can effectively um, deliver a rebuttal argument. So, so oftentimes, at least here in the nation courts, um, there are at least two parts to the oral submissions. There is the part where you deliver your main arguments and then uh, your opponent has a, has a chance to deliver his, his or hers, and then you get a chance to respond. Is there an effective uh, way, in your opinion, uh, that one can deliver such an argument, a rebuttal argument? Yes, uh, my answer consists of three parts. The first part is you need to work out which are the more important points to which you need to respond 
in your rebuttal or reply speech, particularly in circumstances where more often than not, the length or duration of the rebuttal or reply speech will be shorter than the speech to which you are rebutting or replying to. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you've got to pick your best, or rather, you've got to pick your opponent's best points so as to ensure that those points are dealt with. So that's the first part of my three-part answer. The second part of my three-part answer is it's very useful before you respond or reply to very briefly remind the tribunal or the judge of what the point is that the opponent was making and then explain why they are wrong. Thirdly, and this is a particularly useful device, which is um, often it produces great results, is to quote in terms a particular statement that your opponent has made or perhaps his or her witness has given in the course of cross-examination, which supports your case, which you can then co-opt by way of a rebuttal or reply. So for example, if your opponent says that his side did not breach the contract because they had always very diligently observed the performance of their contractual obligations in the sense that they had deployed uh, a special member of staff to routinely monitor the various performance obligations which are built into the contract which were allocated to their side. And if in the course of the cross-examination it transpires that one of their witnesses say, you know, that he went on holiday and he was the designated member of staff for a two-week period during which everything went wrong, then use that evidence perhaps in the language, in the words that were presented by the witness or by the advocate, if, as the case may be, back against them. There is no more effective tool of replying or rebutting to a point that the other side is making than to use their own words back at them. So these are the sort of three tips which I would suggest are effective ways of rebutting or replying to a point which your opponent has made. Thanks, it's very useful. Um, so one of our lawyers, uh, Adrienne, is having some issues with her mic and she has um, posed her question in a written form. She asks, I was wondering how we can strategize our oral submission to capture the attention of a judge, particularly as a junior associate? The answer, uh, thank you, Adrian, for your question. The answer, again, is in the form of structure. And you may have heard me say this, that the structure, particularly one that assumes the form of a list of issues, where what you are doing is you tell the judge that you are addressing them by reference to a list of issues, and then you go through the list of issues and you tell the judge concerned what the submission is or the point you are making by reference to each of those lists of issues. Structure is the best way of capturing the attention of a judge because if they can follow by reference to an established framework, they are more likely to listen to you. Hi, John Fe. Hi, I Michelle. Was just, I was just wondering when we are responding in, a, in any matter, what are the, the ways that you incorporate the replies into your oral submissions? Do you deal with it in the beginning, like in, in a bulk itself, or do you do it as you go through your points? Well, Michelle, I think the distinction has to be drawn between when you are responding. So, for example, if you are the respondent or the defendant, and what you are really doing is you are delivering your opening speech or your closing speech, so it's not a reply per se, then what I would tend to do is I would sort of uh, weave in the my reply to the points which the other side have made within the framework within the substantive framework of the points I want to deploy in the order in which I want to deploy it. So for example, if I say, I've got sort of four points I want to make, you know, the fact, firstly, whether or not there was a contract, secondly, whether or not there was a breach, thirdly, what are the damages, and fourthly, what other ancillary relief I'm seeking. So hypothetically, if that is the case, then I stick to my structure, but in the course of dealing with each of those issues, I weave in my reply to the point which the other side had made, perhaps by saying to the tribunal, you may recall that my learned friend got on his feet or her feet, they said this in the context of um, topic number two, which is about breach, and this is my response. So that's what I would do if I was delivering my substantive oral submissions, I would weave in my reply, however, if what I'm doing is delivering a reply at the end, because sometimes, as you know, particularly if you're acting for the plaintiff or the claimant, uh, you have a right, uh, you have the right to have the final words uh, and therefore the right to deliver a reply speech. Now that's different because that is pure reply. It's not about delivering your substantive points. It's about replying, or in other words, rebutting the points which the other side have made. Then if so, then 
I would refer you back to the sort of three point uh, approach which I set out when uh, Greg asked me the question about how to deliver an effective rebuttal speech. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Michelle. Could I maybe ask if there's um, maybe one more question? So Priyanka's question, as someone who's been in practice for quite some time, what would you say are the uh, classic do's and don'ts in oral advocacy? What would I say are the classic do's and don'ts? Right, do you have another 10 hours? Because I could go on forever on this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let me tell you that what I think is the one classic do and one classic don't. How about that? Um, the one classic do I would I would thoroughly recommend to you all is uh, to get, get straight to the point, which I think you may recall is the one of the observations I made fairly early on. And that applies with as much force to written argument in as much as applies to oral argument. So when you are producing a written argument or even an opinion for that matter, for what it is worth, always get straight to the point. Always give the conclusion, the punchline at the very beginning because then you capture the audience's attention from the very get-go, whether it's the judge or it's your client, if it's a legal opinion. That's the classic do. Now, what is the classic don't? The, the classic don't is failing to answer the question that is posed by the tribunal or the judge. Don't faff around. Don't beat around the bush. Don't try and deflect and you know give a long-winded answer but not really answering the question which the tribunal or the judge has asked because it will not go unnoticed. So that to me is the classic don't. And it's, I'm afraid, something that happens even with the best of practitioners, whether it's in England or any other jurisdiction, but it's a big no-no. And if the answer is not one that is palatable to your case, deal with it head on. Explain why the position is in fact not as, um, as disappointing or as they might otherwise be thought to be the case and why there is in fact an answer that supports your position but whatever it is, answer the question instead of ducking and diving. Because if you duck and dive, then almost certainly you will have lost to the tribunal on that particular point. So that to me is the classic don't. Jonathan, we have uh, another written question uh, from Dawn, one of our senior associates. Um, how do you steady your nerves before your hearings? Truth be told, I, I, the reason why I'm pausing is because I'm, I'm just trying to think of a time when I had nerves. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sort of trying to blow my own trumpet or anything like that, but I, I don't typically have nerves before I, I start a hearing. And it may be because you once you are prepared and if you've done thorough preparation, you don't really have nerves or butterflies before you get on your feet because you know you have prepared and if you do what I do, which is you kick the tires around and you try and anticipate what questions are coming your way, instead of having nerves, you actually feel a sense of excitement that you just want to get on with it because you have much to say and you're very much looking forward to the question and answer session for it sometimes resembles that, that will take place when the oral submissions begin. However, when I was younger there and therefore perhaps uh, less experienced than I am now, Obviously, like all young advocates, you know, I, I would be nervous before a, uh, a big hearing. And I think the way, again, of calming your nerves is, again, through thorough preparation, I'm afraid. I know it sounds a bit boring uh, to give you perhaps a what you might expect to be an old fashioned answer, but I'm afraid there's no panacea for this. There's no magic solution. Uh, it really is through old fashioned preparation. And even when I was a younger advocate, the nerves would disappear the moment I opened my mouth. Because once you open your mouth and you, you, you revved up your engines and you're, you've started, then uh, off you go. It, you, know, you go into autopilot mode and you just let your advocacy take you to wherever it takes you to its ultimate destination. But the reality of it all is that the reason why I, I sort of talk about experience and I refer to what the difference is by comparison to when I was perhaps less experienced is because ultimately the reason why I'm, I'm able to do my cases or to perform as an advocate without actually suffering from nerves of any kind before my, my performance, so to speak of, is because once you do a lot of it, then you get used to it and nothing or very little actually ends up phasing you, even if you've got a bad case. You know, if you've got a bad case, but you've, thorough, you've prepared for it thoroughly, it at least equips you with the prospect of knowing how to deal with the bad points. 
Uh, and in those circumstances, you will be, there's sort of a certain zenness or calmness to just before you get on your feet, such that you know whatever comes what may, whether it's a good case or a bad case, you've thought out all of the possible scenarios without obviously excluding the prospect of a completely left field question, which does occur from time to time. And that necessarily and naturally soothes your nerves such that you are able to deliver an assured and confident performance. Jeffrey, I, 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 uh, I think it may have been about 10 or so years ago uh, when you argued a case at the uh, European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, I think. Uh, and, and I think that the, the panel of judges uh, was, was 12 or 10, uh, it was certainly more than three. Uh, were you not were you not nervous? Were you not faced by by that fact when you were uh, delivering your arguments? Actually, I wasn't. Funnily enough, I was actually excited. I was excited because there was a case where, but you're right. I forget the number of judges now. It was a lot, and uh, but I was excited at that prospect because it was my first time flying solo in the European Court of Justice, and I was effectively on my own against five or six member states of the EU, including the United Kingdom, uh, who was then, which was then a member of the EU. And therefore they were all lined up against me and they were taking points which were in direct uh, opposite, in, you know, in direct opposition to the stance which I was taking on behalf of my client. So no, actually I, I wasn't, I was actually excited because I knew that it was one of those rare opportunities for me to get on my feet in a forum, which I wouldn't other, otherwise regularly appear being the ECJ. Wonderful. Hi, Janice. Hi, Janice. Hi, it's good to see you. Very good to see you too. It's been a long time. Yes, it has been a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Now I have a quick question for you. Yes. Now, how do you manage how do you manage a judge who comes and takes his seat with his mind already made up? long before you are able to persuade him otherwise and they just don't budge it's very frustrating and you also feel that you're not making any progress with them so how, how do you deal with that with humor and charm is the answer <laughs> because there is nothing that is less effective than you badgering the judge mm -hmm. and perhaps like a battering ram trying to dissuade him or her of their initial views on the basis that they are wrong and you're right Rather, the best way also of changing their minds is with humor and charm. And flattery sometimes does get you a certain distance, if not the whole nine yards. And that's how what I would do if I was confronted with a judge or an arbitrator who has perhaps made up their minds or maybe not made up their minds, but, you know, their initial views are set against yours. And there is therefore everything to be said about mm -hmm. trying to charm them round to your point of view. And uh, occasionally it involves you having a conversation with them. More often than not, it does not involve you citing a smorgasbord of authorities to them that effectively tells them why they are wrong. It, sometimes even the best advocates forget that the art of advocacy is really um, it's distilled to its kernel, to its essence, the art of persuading someone in the course of a dialogue. And it boils down to common sense arguments, why you are right. And if you are able to persuade on the basis of rationale, why you are right, it, you find it much easier thereafter to then follow up and say, and by the way, what I've just told you is actually consistent with legal authority. See, for example, this particular authority and that particular authority. So uh, I would say engage them you know, in a conversation uh, obviously in a light-hearted, positive manner, and you will find that you are more than not able to bring them round to at least seeing things from your perspective. If you are lucky, you might even get them to cross the Rubicon over to your side of the argument. Mm. Thank you. In general, actually, just a follow-up to, to that last response. Yes. You, you mentioned that you often sit as an arbitrator. Um, have you found that you've often um, changed your position on a case? Uh, at the end of hearing counsel submissions? I, I wouldn't say I often find myself having changed my mind, but I have occasionally found myself changing my mind. Of course, like with every arbitrator, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't generalize like that, with most prepared arbitrators, you will have a view 
usually, or at least that's what the arbitrator would think, a reasonably well-informed view about what the answer to a particular question would be. But I'm not the sort of arbitrator who closes my mind such that I don't listen to counsel submissions. Quite the opposite. I enjoy actually listening to counsel's oral submissions, stress testing them with questions, and then on the basis of the exchanges which I've had, changing my mind occasionally, or at least finessing in my mind what I think the answer should be, which might ultimately make a difference to the outcome of the case. And that's what I mean when Janice asked me the question, what is the best way of persuading an arbitrator who made up his or her mind? I was not just speaking from my perspective as counsel, I was also speaking, drawing from my experience as an arbitrator, where when I've gone into a hearing and I've sort of come with a tentative view, for I would have a tentative view on almost all, if not all issues on the table, uh, I allow myself to have my mind changed by what I see, what I hear, what I observe, whether it's for oral submissions and or it's cross-examination. Do you, um, when you sit as an arbitrator, sometimes find that um, a lot of your, not a lot, some elements or some aspects of your decision-making process uh, is affected by um, the nature or the demeanor of counsel? Yes. So when someone is, uh, you know, calm and, and, and composed and one that's badgering or rude and is interruptive, uh, how, how does that affect your decision-making? The, the answer is yes, uh, it does affect my decision making because if uh, a counsel when in the course of crossfire from the bench is able to give a calm, composed, rational, and dare I say persuasive answer mm -hmm. to the questions which are coming from the bench, it rather persuades me in a non-verbal way mm -hmm. that that position must have some force to it because of the calm demeanor with which it is being deployed by the advocate who is presenting it. Such is the level of confidence reposed by the advocate in his or her submissions that they can very calmly explain why I am wrong and they are right. In contrast, a rude, arrogant, and aggressive advocate more often than not is very unlikely to persuade a tribunal round. They, it might be that uh, they are able to put on a, you know, big, a sort of a big dog and pony show, which would yeah. go down well with their clients. And perhaps that's what they are trying to achieve, but not otherwise sway the bench in order to change their mind. So what I would say is when you are dealing with the bench, always do so with humor, um, with charm, with a calm and composed manner. When you are dealing with opponents, you should do so with respect, but of course, where the occasion calls for it, then if you need to be firm, then you should be firm with your opponent. Everyone focuses on the demeanor of the witness. They don't realize that sometimes the demeanor of counsel plays a huge role as well. Very much so, including but not limited to when counsel is not speaking. So, and this is perhaps something to draw to everyone's attention, which is even more acute in the era of virtual hearings is, is this, where you have a gallery view and you sort of see other people on the screen. Now, more often than not, the non-speakers will turn off their videos. That would be the typical thing to do. So what you would have therefore on screen are the members of the bench and the lead counsel on both sides. And even when you think you are not speaking, the reality is that other participants in the hearing, including members of the bench, may well have an opportunity and typically do observe your demeanor and how you speak and your reaction to your opponent's points. So if your opponent is making a forceful, powerful point, and what you're doing is you're sort of burying your head in your hands, you know, or you're looking as if you know someone's knocked you by a, a two by six, then you know, naturally that sort of gives the tribunal or the judge the impression that perhaps your opponent is right and even if they are not quite sure about the substance of what they are saying just looking at your reaction to it maybe gives them the confidence that they need to adopt your opponent's points mm. uh, and therefore it's very important that you always put on your best game face when you are at a hearing whether or not you are speaking even more so when it's a virtual hearing and therefore your reactions are amplified for everyone to see. Correct. Jen, we had a, a, another written question uh, from Jen, Jen Kui. 
Uh, hi, Jenfei, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. I wonder if you could provide a little bit of an insight into the process of, uh, of your transition from practice in Malaysia to uh, practice in the UK. Yes, Jen, this is probably a question I cannot answer because uh, uh, unfortunately I've never practiced in Malaysia. So I'm, I'm not sure how I, I can, um, how I'd be able to sort of deal with the question of transition. What I can tell you though, is that in the course of my work, I do work a lot with lawyers from different jurisdictions, including but not limited to Malaysia. There isn't necessarily a transition as such in terms of how I would work when I am collaborating with English lawyers as opposed to Malaysian lawyers. Rather, it's all about ensuring that the way in which you perform as an advocate suits the needs of the forum or it's compatible with the culture of the forum. So, for example, if you have, if you are appearing in a forum which in which people tend to place less emphasis on elongated cross-examination, say, for instance, in civil law jurisdictions, then what you'd have to do is obviously adapt when in Rome, as they say, and therefore uh, adapt your approach accordingly. And similarly, where perhaps you are in a jurisdiction where uh, more emphasis than might otherwise be the case is placed on lengthy oral submissions, perhaps because the judges or the arbitrators in a particular jurisdiction doesn't, don't really read the papers and therefore you've got to spend a bit more time actually talking them through the facts of the case, then that would be the thing to do. So uh, I am perhaps not necessarily answering the question that you asked because the reality is I, I never really practice as a Malaysian practitioner, but if I can be allowed, if I may, to adapt that to say how does one change one's approach depending on the form in which you are appearing is is important to understand what the regular or the normal practice of that forum is and, and, and to ensure that you adapt that practice accordingly. So, for example, to give you another example of what I mean by this, in England, we tend to perhaps be a bit more assertive when we are rebuking opponents for things that they do, which we say is very bad. And uh, by contrast, we are, it may not necessarily be the done thing when you are appearing against lawyers from civil law jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and therefore perhaps have less of a common law-based tradition in advocacy. And it might even be considered rude, if not offensive, if you were to try and tick an opponent off in a civil law, from a civil law jurisdiction, from the perspective of a civil law jurisdiction. So the, the trick to do is to ensure that you moderate, modulate, adapt your advocacy to suit the needs of the forum, and more importantly, for the audience before whom you are appearing. And that is the hallmark of a good advocate to be, to not sure, to ensure that you don't just stick to the one style that you know best, but that you can modulate your style accordingly in order to deliver the best results that suit the forum concerned with which you are appearing. I think Dawn has a question, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dawn has another question. Uh, how would the way uh, in which you deal with expert witnesses differ from the way you deal with factual witnesses? Ah, yes. Very good question, Bob, because um, it's also a very timely question, given that I had to deal with a very tricky expert witness last week in the course of my arbitration. In fact, I think I have, um, in the course of the past year, maybe cross-examined close to you know, 10 expert witnesses over the course of different cases. And the way you deal with expert witnesses is you've got to treat them as professionals, perhaps more so than with a factual witness. It is therefore it, your cross-examination has to be overlaid with a certain modicum of respect. Um, you shouldn't necessarily inundate the factual witness with propositions which, sorry, to inundate the expert witness, I beg your pardon, with propositions that might otherwise be better placed for a factual witness. So for instance, you should try and avoid suggesting to an expert witness that he or she is lying, even if you think that he or she is lying, and perhaps not giving truthful and independent expert evidence. So treat them with sort of some respect. And also to acknowledge the fact that you are really trespassing into their territory, because when you are cross-examining an expert witness, you're really cross-examining them on matters with which they have got better and first-hand knowledge than you do, and to structure it by reference uh, to that fact. And you are more likely, if you are perhaps gentler and more constructive in the questions that you are asking, to elicit the right response from the expert witness. By contrast, a slightly more confrontational approach is usually 
appropriate when you're cross-examining a factual witness. Thanks, Shanti. All right, we have another written question. I hope this is fine, Shanti. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> Leah has asked, um, would the level of court you are appearing before impact your style or structure of submissions? For instance, would you would you do anything different when submitting in the magistrate's court as compared to the Court of Appeal? He said, what uh, the United courts as compared to the United courts? Yes. Uh, the short answer, Leah, to your question is no. The, the supplement to that is thankfully uh, one of the advantages of being more senior is you don't appear in the equivalent of the magistrate's courts. So uh, for me, that would be the equivalent of appearing before a master sort of procedural judge, which I never really fancied. And the but the short answer to the sorry, the slightly elongated answer is no, you don't uh, change your style of advocacy necessarily. Of course, the substance of the advocacy will differ depending on whether or not you are before a judge at first instance or an appellate court. But otherwise, in terms of the things that we have discussed this evening, I wouldn't change, at least not fundamentally, my approach, whether I'm appearing before a, a lower court or an appellate court. Thanks, Shanti. So I think, Jante, we have uh, taken up uh, far too much of your time. Uh, we've gone uh, about 20 minutes or so over. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jante, for your time. And uh, at least I found it to be very, very insightful. Um, learned many things. Uh, and on behalf of the firm, I'd like to thank you uh, and for all the time you've spent and for the very insightful thoughts you've shared with us. Thank you, you so are. much, Jante. Take care. You are welcome, uh, Janice, Greg, and to all your colleagues. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, obviously, having an opportunity and to Ken, of course, to have the opportunity of speaking to you all and sort of sharing with you my experiences. I hope you have found this as enjoyable as I have found uh, it engaging in the dialogue with you all. And thank you for your thoughtful questions. Thank you. Have a great weekend in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye, Ken. Bye. Thank you, Jinfei. Ken. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, everyone. See you.